for some reason, this season, I, I keep returning to this theme of, you know, what is belief all about? And I was particularly struck again by that in a somewhat disturbing way by seeing the ways we put civil religion on display at, at the time of uh, an inauguration, which really just serves to bless society and things as they are without demanding any change or perspective on things. So that's, that kind of thing is on my mind today as I read these passages, especially the gospel reading. It seems to me that when we reduce Christianity to mere belief, when we reduce the cross of Christ to a mere symbol that magically saves us, we miss the deeper meaning of our faith. When we reduce the call of Christ to civil religion that blesses the status quo, when we turn the baptism of Christ into a ritualistic sense of identity, Methodist, Baptist, UCC, we undermine the true power of our faith to transform our lives or our world. For Christ came preaching good news, good news that pointed to a new way of being in the world. Repent. He said, change, he cried, live in new ways for the kingdom of God, God's realm of love and mercy and justice is very near. Then he went out and demonstrated the power of this new way of being by laying his hands on anyone who was diseased or diseased, healing them. Epileptic, paralytic, leper, it didn't matter. Male, female, Gentile, it didn't matter. Jesus healed them. For the kingdom of God, the realm of God's love and mercy and justice had come near. And when you see that, that changes everything. New Testament professor Warren Carter writes that in this passage from Matthew, <clears throat> Jesus further demonstrates the transforming impact of God's reign. And today, how many of us experience such a thing? All too often in our lives, faith has been reduced to an incredulous creed and the reign of God just to a distant dream. <clears throat> when I was 15, my parents moved from the suburbs of a small city to a farm 30 miles from nowhere in central Pennsylvania, <laughs> a place called Friends Cove. I guess we were part of the Back to Nature movement back in the early 70s, but as a 15-year-old boy who could not yet drive, it felt more like back to the end of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I hated it. The farmhouse was old and drafty. There was a cold furnace in the basement at first. There were ladybugs in the windows, wasps in the open-air attic, and mice in the walls. We were essentially outnumbered. <laughs> also, despite the name of the place, there were no friends anywhere in sight, no neighborhood at all. But I could see only two other farmhouses, empty fields and woods, lots of deer, and a mountain ridge rising above us that extended for miles north and south. Every day, the mountain was there. Out the kitchen window in the morning, outside the bus, on the long ride to school, changing colors in the evening, dark against the sky at night. It remained a mystery to me. <coughs> And still, I, until I started taking walks on the, on, on the old logging roads that went up its side, there was nothing else to do in the summer. <laughs> so once my chores were done, I walked a little further and further up the ridge each time. Being alone on the mountain changed me. I began to see things I had not seen before. Red-tailed hawks spiraling high in the sky, rough grass exploding in the air and scaring the crap out of me. <laughs> Meadows of wildflowers sometimes pressed down where deer had slept during the night. I discovered there were trails along the top of the ridge that went for miles in either direction, and the view from the top, I remember sitting up there once and experiencing a profound sense of connection to everything. The woods, the mountain, the earth, God, everything. Suddenly, after that, when I looked up at the mountain, I saw something more like a friend, or maybe even a mentor. I had been changed. Suddenly, I saw beauty and felt God like a presence everywhere around me, on the farm, in the woods, walking in the fields. But it never would have happened. That 
change never would have happened to me if I had not started climbing the mountain. And sometimes I think that's the problem with faith for many of us. The word God looms over us like a dark mystery against the night sky of our lives. What does it even mean to believe in God anyway? Can the reality of the mystery who gave birth to the universe even be conceptualized by the human mind, let alone captured by belief? I don't think so. Christ did not send me merely to baptize, wrote Paul, but to proclaim good news so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. And Jesus came preaching good news that pointed to a new way of being in the world. Change, he cried. Live in new ways, he cried. For the kingdom of God, God's realm of love and mercy and justice is very near. Then he went out and demonstrated the power of this new way of being. I've come to believe that faith is not mere belief. In fact, belief is not meant to be mere belief either. <laughs> It is instead a way, a way of life, a path to walk, a new way of being in the world that engages our whole being in every direction. Love God, love the holy with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, Jesus said, and love your neighbor as yourself. To have faith, to believe in Christ, is to walk a path to practice a new way of being in the world that engages and changes our whole being, heart, mind, soul, and strength in every direction, inward and outward, with the power of love. What does this way look like? Well, we're about to begin a confirmation class of some of our youth that names some of the things that are, that are in it. The practice of prayer, the practice of service to others, especially those in need, the practice of welcoming others as Jesus did. The practice of seeking social justice or working for a world that reflects God's concern for all people. And the practice of spiritual wisdom for reflecting on scripture and the teachings of Jesus to gain fresh insight, a new angle on the meaning of our lives. In his book, Living in the Presence, the well-known teacher of contemplative prayer, Tilden Edwards, said this, Authentic spiritual life has always held together the love of God, self, and neighbor, as expressed in Jesus' summary of the law. Unfortunately, as we all know, there is much in us that counters these sensibilities. We see the fourfold horror of our world, nuclear terror, personal and social oppression, environmental rape and resistance, to communion with God. And such realities tempt us to numbness and escape. Who wants to face into so much suffering, he wrote. And even if we do, what can we hope to accomplish? But it's at this point, he said, that our spiritual formation becomes crucial. We need to develop the spiritual heart that is able to see beyond the suffering to the promise and possibilities that are in us and in our world. We need to uncover our compassion, our particular gifts for active caring, and our particular called for arenas of action, the areas of need that call to us to act. Sisters and brothers, the only way to experiencing the transforming impact of God's reign that Warren Carter spoke about the transforming impact of God's reign in our lives, and to become effective in making it a reality in our world in some way. The only way to do that is to walk the path and practice the way of Christ. When we do, when we try to, when we move in that direction, we will begin to see things we have not seen before. We'll begin to feel a profound sense of connection to everything that is. We will be changed. In the end, there's no way to know the mountain except to climb it. And there's no way to grasp the reality of God with our hearts and minds and souls fully. We can only be changed by that reality <laughs> when we dare to begin to walk the path step by step a little further each day. 
Then wrote Kilvin Edwards, at our great best, we become vehicles of God's mercy through direct caring for the victim of suffering and through our identification with God's vision for the world. Then we begin to recognize God at work in the world in often surprising and hidden ways in those who are considered poor, economically, mentally, physically, socially, or spiritually, in peacemakers and children, in ordinary work and daily human encounters, in reconciliation and cooperation between former enemies, and in endless other outcroppings of divine human collaboration. We find ourselves aware of these situations, praying for them, and joining them as we feel called. So come, sisters and brothers, let us drop our old beliefs like fishing nets by the sea. Come, let us climb the mountain. I'd like to invite you to join me in singing a response this morning. It's number 396. 